family for Ron Larmory. I'm Keith, this is David, our job to bring things to life for you. So what we're going to do to finish the day is give you what we believe to be a genuine sword fighting lesson from a genuine sword fighting manual. A manual that's called 130. Would you like to be my today? Oh, yeah, I'll show the manual around. Um, it's called 133 uh, very often because that was its accession number when the Royal Armouries <laughs> came into possession of it. Uh, it's also sometimes known as the Tower of Theft book or Fight book or Old Valpurgis manuscript. And it's remarkable for three reasons. First of all, it's the earliest known surviving Western European sword fighting manual, which makes it something really unusual. Was written probably between 1300 and 1320 in northern Germany. The second reason it's unusual is because the people who are fighting in it aren't soldiers, aren't knights, aren't men at arms, they are clerics. They are churchmen, a priest, and a younger person who's under uh, his tuition. And finally, it's unusual because in the final pages of the manual, we see a woman involved in the sword fight. And no matter what we may think from modern films and television, for the early medieval period, that is absolutely extraordinary. There are no other known references to women taking part in martial arts at that period. Their power was in a different sphere in terms of society. Now, it could be that this is a symbolic reference because we know that she sent Valperga, who was an English woman who went to Germany and was canonized and became a saint. But on the other hand, it may be a clue that there was female involvement in martial arts in this early period. That, I think, is what most, most of us would like to think. So, very, very unusual manual for all those reasons. So what weapons are we fighting today? We are fighting with a sword and a buckler. So, the sword and buckler is a combination, a very popular sort of form of weaponry in Europe during the medieval period, and all the way up, really, to the European period as well. Uh, in this particular case, we have a one-handed sword. Uh, this sword uh, has a sharp blade, it's got two sides to it, and it's a straight-edge blade. Typically, it would have a very sharp point as well, however, we have the points rolled over on these swords today, so we don't actually take eyes out and things like that. So, it's safe. At the base of the sword, we have ourselves a cross guard, that's there to protect the hand and wrist from any incoming blades. And at the bottom of the sword, we have ourselves a big bit of metal known as the pommel, uh, and this can be defensively hits on the lid. The main purpose of the pommel is there to balance the blade. It allows you to swing the blade around with relative dexterity. Now, accompanying the sword, we have ourselves a buckler. And the buckler is a very small round shield made out of solid metal. Uh, and yes, it's not going to stop an arrow, it's cool, that's not what it's for. It is a small shield designed for enabling me to simply place it in between myself and an opponent's weapon, hopefully open up the guard, and then finish them off with the sword. But we'll talk a bit more about the techniques. Let's talk about the techniques themselves. Yes, so first of all, we'll talk about the guards. So there are several guards in this manual, positions for which you might begin uh, to attack or might begin to defend yourself. Dave, what guard are you going to take? So I'll be taking up the half shield, I'll place the sword down the centre line towards my opponent, and I'll place the shield over the top to protect the hand. Good position, which means the key part is run straight at me. I have to work out a way around my sword. Splendid, all right. So, as a teacher, I'm going to take my own favourite guard, which is called the First Guard, possibly because it's like this. Uh, some illustrations might suggest it's a bit higher, but we believe essentially what it's showing is the sword either in the scabbard or thrust through the belt, or possibly in a position where you would carry it as the vehicle that came in, in our left hand. So that means that you would essentially grab the sword and immediately bring the buckler over to protect your hand, and then you'd be in the position of having to fight from here. So as David said, I'm going to find a way round the guard. So what I'm going to do is come round with my left foot as I aim. It could be a cut, it could be a thrust. I'll make it a cut uh, in the high line for his face. Thus. Very nice. What do you think? Well, obviously, I'm going to do myself a sheer, not sure, strike, a thrust strike. Thrust strike! There we go, that's thrust strike. I'm just a scholar, I'm still learning. Uh, so I'm doing the thrust strike. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take control of King's weapon and hopefully leave my sword of life. So as you can see, I've stepped to the side and applied pressure against the sword and let the point of my sword in position to thrust forward or to have keys on the end. Nasty. Alright. 
So can I do anything to stop that happening? Well, yes, I can. Pressure is a big feature of teaching in medieval sword fighting. Uh, and it was up until recently in modern fencing as well, where there was more blade contact. The idea being, if you are in contact with your opponent's blade, you can feel pressure. If you can feel pressure, you may have some idea of what he's going to do with his sword. So here's the trick. As I come in for the attack and he comes in for his attack, if I can then outthink him, if when I feel his pressure on my blade, I can change my body position, my sword position, I might defeat him. We want to call the shield strike. If one gets it right, it should look something like this. Very nice. So what's happening there is, that as he comes in, uh, as I go into the attack, he simultaneously comes in for his. I bring my sword over the top, leaving uh, my uh, buffer over the top. I am now smothering both of these weapons. I'm able to flip the sword up with what's called a nookin, a rising cut. And the translation would be either flipping or nodding. Flipping presumably because of the way that this flips, but nodding because if I slice him under the chin from there, it's very definitely going to make him nod. However, it does go on to say that I can use the very same technique if he tries to do that to me. Uh, so, hopefully, my time is right. Uh -huh. so there we are. So, I did the exact same thing, bringing that sword up and slashing. So these are very basic techniques that occur right the way through the manual. One of the things that the priest says right at the beginning, he's got a narrator, and he says, you know, if you can, don't be the first to attack. But the problem being the first to attack is that if that person moves in on you, as we've just been talking about, you wind up walking onto their sword. But even if you don't, you're going to draw out the fight by having to bring all these other techniques into play. Far better to master your opponent's blade right from the beginning if you can. So you do that by binding, which is essentially taking your opponent's blade and pushing it aside as you make your attack. So it's what we've been doing previously, but it now becomes an offensive rather than a defensive technique. So, for instance, if I was now going to bind his blade and attack, what I would do is something like this. Hopefully I'll be fast enough to take his blade and then move in, having displaced it. What can he do about that? Well, that's not very nice. <laughs> uh, but I could use the same principle to help get myself on a buck in the advertising side of it. So, essentially what I'm going to do is take the top of his sword and open his own blade. Ooh, nice. Okay. So all I did there was as he took my sword aside, I felt the pressure. As he stepped through, I stepped back into my sword with space. Then from here, pushed the sword aside and stepped into something. Now that might be something you can't get out of. And certainly it's extremely difficult to get out of. There is a technique in the manual that we believe deals with that, and it's called changing the sword. Which essentially means if he pushes your sword down, you come over the top. If he pushes your sword up, you come underneath. So, if I can get this right, I may be able to get out of trouble. Nice, very yeah. nice. So essentially what was happening there was that I took the blade, I made the thrust. I then took my sword out of the line, he came in for his thrust, but I was already there to beat his sword out of the way, and simultaneously beat his buckler up, and then from there, the sword comes up, and once again, the looking comes into play. Very nice. However, I do suspect that as a clergyman, as a man of the church, you don't want to kill your entire flock. So there are <laughs> techniques to maybe disarm someone? There are. There are very really many techniques to manage that don't involve slicing people or sticking them in the sword. So let's have a look at the grapple. Shall we? Let's see if I can get a grapple off. Now what we'll do is we'll stick with the same intro techniques because this is how the manual works. It's a bit like a modern uh, language manual or language tape or language video. You know, you, you get a few words, you string them together, then you start stringing a few more words. At some point you come back to the original words and you go off in a different direction. So that's what we're going to do in a slightly different direction. So, there's a grab. So what's happening there is that, as I take the blade, I make a thrust, I bring it down, I come in from my own thrust, but this time I actually stick on his blade, 
I move to the opposite side, I bring my arm round as his arms go flying past me, and I take him under the arm. Now from here, what I would probably do is actually simply crouch and throw him on the ground. But, you know, once I've got him trapped in this position, there's pretty much anything I can do. He would just sort of back back him on the head, crack him with the buckler, any number of things. So I've got him immobilized. Very nice. However, I suspect there might be a way out of that. You do, you do. I do, I do believe it's a half to that particular grapple. Alright, well, let's see what happens to that grapple. Keep the weapons pointed up in the air, keep it in your eye line, and don't walk away from us 